The soil needs to be uh, screened down to uh, something that will mix easily with the water in the Portland when you're getting ready to put it in the block machine. This is the screen that matters right here. I don't, we're not necessarily going to fire this thing up because it's real noisy and real dirty, but, but the, uh, the soil goes in that hopper, comes up the belt, and then falls down, and this thing is shaking. It's got chains on the stuff. So the good stuff falls right through this screen into this bin here. Everything that's too big continues on down, and that's what's over here. Okay, last year we had a quarter inch screen on here. Real nice, you know, the, the soil is very finely screened and it works really great in the blocks. But with, but with this soil, it's pretty slow. Um, you know, we're not getting a tremendous percentage of that as it goes through the quarter inch screen. My favorite dimension has always been 3 eighths. That's what we used in Baja and what I've used in Texas was a 3 8 screen. So we were told that the screener which came from over there that the guy that had it over there had a half inch screen that we could have. So this winter while we were gone uh, we, we had the quarter inch screen taken out and the half inch screen put in. It's too big. Three eighths is just right. I can show you some blocks down there that we made with the half inch. And they're structurally acceptable. They're just not pretty enough, you know, um, because they've got half inch, a lot of half inch rocks in them. And so you get a bunch of those along the edge and you can knock them off and it does, just doesn't look good. So we're gonna, we're gonna go to what I wanted in the first place, which was three eighths uh, ASAP, like next week when you guys leave. We're going to put a 3 8 screen on here and then we'll have speeded this up a little bit and be back down to a size that gives us a pretty block. Okay, so that's how this works. This is a gasoline powered engine, a Ford engine. I think it's about from 1942. Uh, runs like a clock. They don't make this Coleman anymore, uh, but it's a, it's a heck of a machine. It really is. It's ancient, but it runs great. Dry dirt is, this is, good question, this is key to block making. Uh, unlike uh, Lisa's adobes where you want it wet, if we get wet, we're, we can't do anything. You know, because we have to screen it, we have to run it through the mixer, we have to run it through the block machine. If the soil's too wet, it'll extrude the block instead of making a block. We like our material to be bone dry, and then we add however much moisture we want. Okay, if it's a little damp, we're okay, but if it's soaking wet, we're toast. Okay, that's a problem right here because we are in, as most of you know, Colorado. What we're doing about it, don't step back uh, because you'll fall in a trench, that's, that's, a, that's a water war trench right there. So that we protect the pile. Now we can throw the tarps over the pile. We've got eye bolts to tie the rope to, throw over and hold the tarps down. Plus the trench with the concrete will keep the groundwater from going into the bottom of the pile and wicking up. So that's our, that's our defense this year. But dry dirt is, uh, is critical. You can, you can do it without rocks. You can do it with rock. You can do it with sand and clay and, and stabilizer and make a beautiful and structurally sound earth block. However, if you have some small rocks in it, it's going to be stronger. Yeah, but you know, it's, it's, it's not really necessary. This is, you know, I mean, it's just like anything else. You know, do I want the perfect block? I want, you know, 2300 PSI diamond crisp edge, you know, and I'll spend anything to get it. No, you don't want to do that because, you know, the New Mexico code for uh, a block is 300 PSI. You know, our crummy blocks are 1500 PSI. You know, we're five times the code without trying, you know, so what you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to truck in a bunch of gravel or do something special to try to get to 1800 PSI, would you? I mean, maybe you would, but probably not. There's three steps in making a great earth block, okay? There's the mix, there's the machine, 
and there's the cure. The machine is the least important. Everybody's mashing dirt into blocks. There's a thousand machines around the world. They're going from the side, they're going from the bottom, they're going from the top. Some of them are going from both sides. The mix is, is critical. You know, that's really critical. And then you can have a great mix, have a good machine, make a block, you're stabilizing it. Let's say you put Portland cement in for the stabilizer and you took it out of the machine and you set it out in the sun. Eh. Your, your Portland won't hydrate. The, the sun will dry, the sun or the wind will dry, take that moisture out of the block right away and the Portland won't have a chance to hydrate and your block won't be stabilized. So the cure is critical. You gotta get it on the pallet or in the pile or whatever, keep misting it and cover it up. So that it has, so the Portland and the water have a chance to do their dance. This is particularly important if you're stabilizing with lime. The ASTM cure for cement is 28 days, okay? But a cement stabilized block is a rock in a week to 10 days. You can build with it that quickly. If you're stabilizing with lime, the cure is also 28 days and you need it. You need that 28 days. Uh, and the reason for that is when you're, when you're stabilizing with cement, well, let me step back just a little bit. There's four ingredients in soil anywhere in the world. There's gravel, sand, silt, and clay. Different kinds of clay, different size gravel, blah, blah, blah. But those are the four ingredients anywhere. When you're stabilizing with Portland cement, the cement is grabbing the sand and the gravel and combining. It doesn't really care about the clay that much. You need the clay to hold the block in the shape when it comes out of the machine, but you're making a cement stabilized block where the cement's combining with the sand and gravel, primarily. With lime, it's exactly the opposite. The lime doesn't care anything about the sand and gravel. It's the clay. It loves the clay. Clay has a negative electrical charge. Uh, sand, gravel, and silt are neutral. Clay is a negative. That's why it's sticky. That's why if you walk around when it's wet, your shoes look like Mickey Mouse. It's because of that negative charge that the clay has. And the clay and the lime really like each other. They would like to get together. They're attracted to each other. But when you put them together in a nice moist earth block, you need to let them dance in a cool or at least dark, moist place. For 28 days, they'll marry, they'll never divorce. If you take them out early, you could have marital problems. They're, they didn't finish. You know, they didn't get together. The, the chemical reaction was not complete between the, the clay and the lime. So the lime takes a little longer. You could, and there's actually places where you probably should. And those places, a couple that I would use as an example is one, your interior walls. They're never gonna get wet. Maybe you don't stabilize, you know? Um, and then the other place you would do it is uh, in a climate uh, of which there are many like this around the world where you know they have a monsoon season and then it doesn't rain for nine months. Oh, well, you can make your blocks and build your whole building and get it plastered and get the roof on it before it's ever gonna rain again. You know, so you might do it there. And the reason you might do it there, the other reason you might do it there is it's cheaper. You know, the stabilizer is the most expensive thing you put in the block. The dirt's cheap. Water's pretty cheap, sand's cheap. It's the Portland and the lime that you go down and buy. You know, they're the high embodied energy, manufactured, expensive product, okay? We're proud of the fact that we use very little, but we're still, we're using it. There's still, even after construction, even when you're done, there are some advantages to being stabilized, of course. Uh, one is you go away on vacation for three weeks and the supply line blows out from under your sink and you come home and there's two inches of water running around your house. You wish you had stabilized blocks. The other place where you take damage uh, externally on the building is, uh, well, you leave the window open and it rains. You know, you went to the grocery store and you forgot and you left the windows open and the, the downpour came, you know, and all the water came in the window. Well, you went, your blocks get wet 
and they'll be damaged. They won't be ruined, you know, but they'll be damaged. Then the other thing is you have leaks in your, in your protection. You know, like I always tell people when you have the nice wood lintels over your windows and stuff, they're beautiful. Look at them on the inside, you know, because if you leave them exposed outside, it looks great. But what you have at that spot is you have wood. You maybe have insulation if you're in Colorado. You have earth blocks. You have wire. You have plaster. All these things expand and contract at a different rate in a weather situation. So there's advantages to having them stabilized, you know. But, you know, there's, there's thousands and thousands of buildings around the world that have been there for thousands of years that are unstabilized blocks, you know. So it can be done. And then the other thing, if you're building in developing nations um, where they don't have any money, you know, again, the, the cement is the expensive ingredient, you know, so you could skip it, save some money. Why not take the blocks right out of the machine and put them in the wall? Mm -hmm. Sounds like a real smart thing to do because you'd save setting them down and picking them up it's and it's a lot of labor, right? You can do it, but what's wrong with it is that first of all, when the blocks come out of the machine, they're still green. They're not rocks. They're still, you can break them. You can break the corners off. You can break the block. It's, it's, it hasn't cured yet. It's a newborn baby. You know, you handle it like this. So if they're coming out of the machine and you've got your masons trying to build a wall with them, they're going to break a whole bunch of them. They're going to knock the corners off. They're going to break them in half. You can do it, but just figure on making maybe 20% more blocks. Ooh. There's a cost, right? Then the other thing about it is that there's moisture, even though it's only 10%, there's moisture in that block and it's gonna leave. And when it leaves, the block is gonna shrink. It doesn't shrink very much, but it shrinks maybe 3 sixteenths or an eighth or something in length uh, when it cures. 98% of that happens in the first two or three days, okay? After those days, it's pretty much done shrinking. But the point is, if you take them out of the machine and you put them right in the wall, we're trying to build a thermally perfect wall, right? And you put them in there and they all shrink. So every 10 or 12 or 14 inches, depending on whatever your layout is, you got a hole in the wall, you know? Not really, not really your thermal perfection you're after. Even if you mortar the head joint, the block's going to shrink away from there, and you're going to have, you're going to have a little hole. Every you know, so so it's the breakage and the shrinkage that I would say are the reasons why I don't do it.